Thank you very much uh, for that wonderful presentation. So there's a lot there to pack in, uh, and I'm sure there's a lot there in terms of uh, questions that you would like to ask. So uh, we'll now open it to the floor, and uh, if people could um, try to ask questions if possible, because we've got a limited amount of time. The professor does need to go to another engagement shortly after the program. So um, yeah, we've got a microphone that will be going around. So who would like to ask the first question? One hand here, and one hand there. We'll go. This gentleman first. Uh, thank you. I just read an article in the current edition of Melbourne Catholic, and it was written by a person who I think has responsibilities in the diocese for interfaith dialogue. And the conclusion of the article was, it is most effective when not only do you fully understand where the other person's coming from, but you are able to repeat it back to them Mm. And then you can engage in a, um, a debate. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't very convinced, but what are your thoughts on maybe commenting on that and then maybe commenting on if I went to my local mosque, what would be the best way for me to engage in dialogue? Yeah, um, first of all, I'm glad to see that that was in the diocesan newspaper, that at least the issue is being addressed. I would think, I mean, I, I'd have to read it, of course, to say, but I think this idea that I not only you know, hear and nod my head, oh, that's what you believe, that's very nice, but the ability of appropriate it enough that I say it back, presumably not parroting it back by just repeating it, like I'll play back the recording, but rather, um, it, here is what I hear you saying in my words out of my background. The skill of being able to be a good listener um, is a great step forward. And ideally with a corrective possibility where the person can say, no, I didn't mean that, I didn't mean that, back and forth between the two. Um, so I think all of that is definitely a step forward. And then what was the second part of your... You, you had a, a oh, well, you probably answered it, but your approach to dialogue is somewhat in a Yeah, so if you, okay, uh, uh, let's say if, if you go to the mosque on Friday or the Hindu temple on Saturday or the Catholic mass on Sunday, whatever, First of all, go more than once. Uh, a one-time trip is not enough because it's you know, breaking new ground and seeing new things. To some extent, fitting in. You, know, you, you observe around you, oh, people take their shoes off, I'll take my shoes off. Uh, people line up shoulder to shoulder, I'll do that. Uh, people walk clockwise, not counterclockwise around the Morti, the shrine, I'll do that. And then hopefully, if there are receptive people, you talk to people a bit, <coughs> You visit their little bookstore, maybe you learn something, and come back. But it, it's not going to be, you know, here I am. I'm waiting here. I'm looking at my watch, and we're ready for a dialogue. So now you have to dialogue with me. But rather, who are you? Do you show that you have a track record? That you're you're willing to come more than once? There may be occasions like when the diocese arranges a dialogue meeting, but a lot of times it's just show up a few times and then be the kind of person who can carry on the conversation. Uh, I just want you to define to us what is mystical theology and how can a person go from learning a religion to become a mystic? And what is really mysticism? Ah. I know this is a difficult question. Do we have about two hours we could do this? <laughs> uh, so I, th I think it um, depends on what, you know, some people may think of mysticism in terms of uh, extraordinary visions, extraordinary hearing, floating off the ground, or having a light shining out of you and so on like that. All of that may be possible. Um, the great Catholic theologian Karl Rahner, who was one of the great Catholic theologians of the 20th century, said that basically every human being is a mystic because we're opening into the presence of God. And God is always more than our bodies, our words, our actions, anything we can grasp with our minds. So we're opening up into the infinity of God. It's just that a lot of people don't realize that they're mystics. And they think that it's a much more limited thing, like do you believe in God or not? What's the definition of God or not? No, suddenly you realize you're in the presence. So I think good theology should be mystical theology in the sense that you use your tradition, you do your study, you read the text, you can define things, and then realize it's not enough. And the words begin to like fall away and you open up into some experience. The final thing would be the great Catholic theologian Thomas Aquinas. Um, there's a story about at the end of his life, 
he had written all books that have given headaches to students for, for centuries. But at the end of his life, he said, it's all straw. Like, what was the point of all this? After writing the books, he didn't mean, therefore, nobody should read or write books anymore. But when you've done everything you can and said everything, then you realize all those words were never enough. So I think there's a deep mysticism that you could talk about Muslim, Christian, Buddhist, Hindu, where we are human and we use everything we are and have and then let go of it and kind of leap into the divine. Uh, thank you very much, Francis, for your fabulous lecture. It thank is you. very informative and very inspiring. Thank you. Uh, I was particularly taken with your notion of us developing a kind of a, a, a deep practice of learning from the religious other. And I'm wondering if you have any sort of practical <laughs> a solution, a practical guides. But I'm also interested in how you would talk to someone from the spiritual but not religious tradition in terms of that um, aim. Yeah. I, th I think, um, so how do we, you know, how do you do this? How do you take up this vocation of interreligious learning? I think in some ways it's, it's an intuitive matter. You, there are, here are the religions you could study. Um, figure out either some personal connection or some friendship that focuses you toward one religion or another, and then figure out how can I best begin to learn. And I would say, because we're talking about learning of a certain sort, find something to read and study. So in, in Sydney the other day, I was talking about the wonderful book that's come out, The Study Quran. And it's this big, fat volume, uh, <clears throat> a commentary on every verse of the Quran, where most pages are like 80% commentary and then a little bit of text. For me, who doesn't know Arabic, a book like that is perfect for beginning to get into Islamic tradition, or the Christian parallel, or uh, a great commentary on the Bhagavad Gita or something. In a good translation, ask somebody, and you get into it. And then set aside time, side, set aside time each week. You might only have an hour on Sunday morning, or you know, Friday afternoon, or something like that, where you can do this, and just say, well, that's my study hour close the door, turn off the phone, and do it. And sometimes it'll be frustrating. And other times you'll look back and say, wait, I've been doing this for six months and I'm only on page four. To do it and keep doing it. I teach spiritual but not religious students for, I get paid to do that. Um, at Harvard Divinity School, which is a liberal divinity school of Protestant background, so many of our students are there because they're seekers, because they don't want to go to a Presbyterian place or a Catholic place. They may be Muslim or Buddhist and don't want to go into a monastery or a traditional learning site. I'll offer courses like Krishna and Christ or Hindu goddesses and the Virgin Mary and try to show them that don't be afraid to think about these things. Don't be afraid to learn from the tradition. Nobody's going to make you sign up for it. But to show them that some kind of a deeper, sustained learning is possible. And here's what it's done in my life. Uh, now, if you're, if you're a teacher in a divinity school, well, that's a, a great start. So you should be a teacher in a divinity school. But if you're not, then other ways in which you're talking with young people about how it's not a dead option between either 100% I follow everything or I reject it entirely. But kind of compromise negotiation with tradition where you learn a little bit but keep your wits about you is a starting point. But, and then show them I, every Sunday morning, I do an hour of this and it really has been helping me or something like that. It's a big question though. Yeah. Hi, thank you very much. It's been a really inspiring talk. Um, as a Tamil person and part of the Indian diaspora um, and as a teacher myself, so just touching on what you said before, um, I've got two questions. One is why have you chosen the Tamil tradition um, of a particular uh, to study, because as a Tamil, I would love to know a bit more about my own traditions, which um, I, have, I think I've lost. Uh, and the other thing is, as an educator and as a parent, how do we actually make religious doctor, the value of religion more relevant in this particular period? Because it's getting more and more difficult, as you say, mm -hmm. to make it relevant. So I, I, I think sometimes the language that we um, that we phrase certain uh, ideas, mm. religious ideas, is quite important in order to get through to uh, to the generations of today. Mm -hmm. So, what are your ideas? It's all about. I think it's a lot to do with relevance. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, what do you advise there? I mean, on the on the second question first, I would think that um, 
organizations like this one and Affinity and so on and other interfaith groups are committed people like all of you. I mean, you know, talk to everybody here. How is it that knowing about all the troubles of today's world, it's still important to care about religion and then to be open to being interreligious? Why is that the case? You could just have a scientist who's working on global warming without any religious commitments at all. Or you could have somebody who's feeding refugees without any religious commitment. But in terms of the horizon, like why we do this, or when everything seems to be endlessly hopeless, where do you get the faith to keep at it? Um, why should I care about my neighbor? Why should I care about the billion people who are too poor? Et cetera, et cetera. The, there can be deep wells of religious responsibility or religious compassion um, that I think ideally our religion you know, isn't like shutters that I notice nothing else, but rather it gives us a fearlessness to be able to pay attention to the world as it is and to hear the cries of the poor and to see the problems and to observe kind of the obsessions and lusts of making more money all the time so in some sense, being religious gives you a certain freedom to, to not be sucked into the way the world is going, and also some kind of vulnerability to care about people that nobody else cares about. So I, I, you know, it would depend on different traditions on what the motivation is. But that I think, I, w I would not say that you know, non-religious people are hopeless or necessarily selfish or something. I think I have many examples to the contrary, but that religious people have resources for caring about the world and being compassionate that we should just use in the 21st century. Why Tamil? The short reason is I got to University of Chicago in 1979 and had a choice of, all right, you're doing Sanskrit, then there's Urdu, Hindi, Bengali, or Tamil. And my professor, uh, the chair of the department was A.K. Ramanujan, who's a great Tamil scholar and I was just swept away by his beautiful poetry and so on. But then I found for the past uh, 40 years, uh, there's nothing like the Divya Prabandham or the Tamil saints, uh, the Alvars, and the, the beauty of the poetry, the profound link between the community and the poetry, the, the spiritual path, uh, the, the tradition, the parampara of teachers and so on like that. I mean, I'm not, I'm, all these years, I can read Tamil fairly well. I can't speak it very well. But it, it's such a beautiful tradition, an unbroken tradition of thousands of years that has interacted with Hindi but, uh, and Sanskrit but not been overwhelmed by them. I think it's hard to say there's any tradition quite like Tamil that I know of. And therefore, you should teach everybody to love Tamil language. Yeah. Professor, thank you very much for your talk. It was absolutely an eye-opener. Um, as a journalist, I've got a, a, a question that um, perhaps might be a little uncomfortable for some, but um, how are we to understand extremism in religion? Um, all you have said makes a lot of sense, um, but it starts from the basis that all practitioners and believers are sensible, and thankfully most of them are. But the opportunity to reach extreme levels of different religions, be it Islamist extremism or Buddhist ex extremism, who we know um, are now carrying out atrocities in, uh, in the world over. Um, I'm thinking of Myanmar and, of course, Islamic State. Uh, or evangelicals who, albeit without weapons, um, have found a way, um, some, to weaponize speech in a very modern way in the new media. How are we to process that? Um, is mutual understanding the answer, or is there some, something else that's needed? I mean, I, I think I would say, and, and in your reporting, I'm sure you run into this all the time, these questions are complicated, and there's not going to be one answer. And so there has to be, you know, the conditions under which people become extremists may sometimes be dealing with colonialism or economic, you know, lack of jobs or the disruption of a traditional culture that may not be explicitly religious. I think of the, you know, the turmoil in Northern Ireland you know, 40 years ago between Catholic and Protestant wasn't debates over Catholic doctrinal points. There are all kinds of other stuff going on. So there, there's always other stuff going on. But I think the, the things I was touching on, um, you know, secularization, the seeming endless pluralism, 
uh, our young people are losing their way can be exceedingly frightening to people, particularly true believers, that we're losing everything we care about. And one attitude to that can be um, you know, fear and therefore anger, and therefore our back is against the wall and it's our time to fight back. So that I can see, and, and therefore not at all justifying acts of violence, but a certain sympathy with people who are terrified that they're losing everything. And that secularism and pluralism and modern societies are out to destroy our religion. There's a certain fear there, but the, the fear then turns into violence and so on, and that um, and hatred of the other. Being a well, I, I think I was going to say that you know, the question I would ask people is: You claim that you're a very concerned believer. How much do you actually know about your own religion? Are you educated? Are you informed? You have a simplistic view of it. You've never studied it. Uh, you've mouthed the words that your teachers or priests have given you. And you also don't know anything about the other religions. And you, you caricature them and you trivialize them. I, again, I'm a professor, a teacher, and saying one way to break through the fear and the anger is by some kind of education. But how do you educate people who are fearful and angry? because they're not going to come to Harvard Divinity School and take my classes. But some kind of um, you know, information versus disinformation. I mean, the journalism and the media trying to push back and say, you literally don't know what you're talking about because you've never actually read the New Testament, you've never read the Koran, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know, it's, it's, not, it's a kind of weak response in terms of you know, the, the crises of violence. But, but I think one element is fear that may be legitimate at a certain point and then uh, a lashing out rather than learning. Just one other point, I, I was in India a few years ago visiting at a university and giving lectures on religion in the philosophy department. And the question came up, why don't, why don't you have a religion department to do these things? Because people don't want religion departments in the university because that will bring fanaticism to campus. And they may be right, I mean, how do I know? But th that's a very sad development when I think that having classes and study of religion on a campus could be a way of kind of showing the shallowness of fanaticism. That it, it's, not, it's not even faithful to my own tradition, much less to human being. And if we can't study these things and talk about them on a university campus, then we're really bad off. But the, but the thing was, oh no, then all the fanatics will show up and they'll dominate the curriculum and then we'll be all worse off than we were. So there's a lot more to say. Yeah. So we had, we'll okay. finish off the last two questions. Hannah and the gentleman up the back. Uh, okay, two points. Uh, can we have a good society that is not necessarily religiously based? So can you love your neighbour without having religious underpinnings? But the second point, and I'd like you to go to that one first, is the anti-intellectualism that is pervading society. So how do we learn in a society that is increasingly valuing anything intellectual less or facts less? So we don't have the infrastructure for that discovery. Yeah. Yep. And, with, and the gentleman at the back, I think. did you want to ask a question as well? Thank you very much, Professor Clooney. In your presentation, one of the subpoints was integral and parallel ideas, and that word integral is used in a lot of circles and is associated with Ken Wilber. And another related uh, observation I have is that there's a growth in interfaith ministers and in interfaith activities. And uh, so I'm just wondering your comment on these attempts to see things integrated and pulled together and so on and so forth. And I speak both as a Baptist minister who recognises all the bad bits about our tradition, but mm -hmm. still happy to mm -hmm. affirm my connection, and as a multi-faith coordinator of a multi-faith facility in a university. Okay. Okay, so on, on your points first, I, I think, again, as I said earlier, I, I don't believe that people who, are, who don't believe in God are bad people. I, don't, I believe you can be you know, spiritually alive, you can also be a true neighbour to people in trouble, without being a religious person. So the demonization of the secular person as corrupt, selfish, etc., is not true. 
I, I think people can be romantic and say, if you just take away religion, people will be naturally good. I think that's not true either. Um, but I think society, while going back to a, a single religion base, I don't see how that would happen. And even societies that are a single religion base are changing anyway. And then places like Melbourne and Boston and New York and Sydney and so on like that, if we're going to be religious at all, it has to be in this kind of religiously complicated, interreligious way. And that the idea, you know, if only we put back in Christian values, then everything would be all right. Well, that's just too bad because that's not going to happen. Um, but rather, if we have Christians who are sensitive and open to Muslims and Muslims open to Jews and Jews open to Buddhists and so on, weaving that together, I think, can be a great step forward. Um, what was your, your second point was? Anti-intellectualism Anti is at the core of it. It was with the previous point I made about. Um, Kim yeah, Kim who? Kim <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, that's part of the problem. Is this, um, as I was saying at the beginning, it never before in history have we had opp more opportunities to learn interreligiously, and less patience to do so, and people saying, "Oh, I don't want to read those books anymore," etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I think, how does an intellectual respond to anti-intellectualism? It's not by giving boring lectures. Um, and it has to be, in some way, you know, cleverly using the media and so on. But there has to be some sense of witnessing to it by showing that you know, if people think, oh, pointy-headed intellectuals are just talking, some kind of language of wisdom, of empathy, of understanding, and showing that that comes out of traditions it's so a good example in some way. You, know, you, you can legislate what's being taught in the schools and so on, but unless the teachers and the parents of the students are somehow seeing the evidence that learning makes a difference, it's going to be very hard. But, but insisting, at least, I mean, in conversations, anti-intellectualism is not only intellectually, but also religiously and spiritually a really bad idea. And I refuse to accept that premise. Some kind of pushing back in a nice way. Um, your, did you have a question with, I wasn't clear what the question was. Because there's these other ways of people coming together, interfaith communities or integral philosophy. Uh, if you're talking about the relationship between religious traditions. I just wanted your comment on those connecting integral inter networks that evolve yeah. and they ordain their own and credit them. And so well, I think you need, I mean, you need to create social structures and like mediate organizations like this one, where people have conversations like this at lunchtime on a Monday. It's a wonderful thing where people come together and talk across boundaries because our society militates, to get, you know, religion can be left out altogether or it can be, you know, the preaching to the choir, religious people talking to their own religious people only. So you need groups like this, and you need like the conference at uh, Australian Catholic University tomorrow and Wednesday on interreligious learning, affinity, other groups. You need, you know, out of a Baptist background or Catholic or Sunni Muslim or Theravada Buddhist, whatever, you need groups kind of saying, yeah, we meditate, yeah, we pray, yeah, we do good works, but we also learn. And the future in the 21st century is our learning includes interreligious learning. But that doesn't mean anything unless the leaders, you know, the priests and the pastors and so on, create spaces where that can take place so young people can find where to come and how to do it. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a duty, it's a commandment in the 21st century. Create the space for interreligious learning, I think. Yeah. I think that's a good way to, to finish off, so thanks very much for that reminder. May I say that this space and the, this uh, area of activity is well represented here today with many organisations who do similar work to what we try to aspire to. So please thank Professor Francis Clooney for his wonderful presentation. Thank you.